you may have noticed in that story, a photo of Charles Lindbergh who took off in that airplane named the Spirit of St. Louis early one morning in May of 1927 and thrilled the world. My dad said when he was a kid, when they saw an airplane overhead, which wasn't all that often back then, they'd say, there goes Lucky Lindy. What he did was an achievement of planning, design, engineering, guts, and luck. And he ushered in a new era of technology and celebrity. This is a story that has long fascinated me. So when his daughter, Reeve Lindbergh, visited St. Louis a few years ago, I jumped at the chance to hear what she had to say about the man and the flight. The kind of public and private life is, is, is one you have to constantly work with in a family like mine. You know, what belongs to me and, and, and what may I and can I share with, with the world. Uh, Reeve Lindbergh has learned to live with being a Lindbergh. She was the youngest daughter of Charles and Anne Morrow Lindbergh, one of the most famous couples of the 20th century. Reeve Lindbergh, who lives in Vermont, came to St. Louis in early 2005 as the guest of the Lindbergh School District, named, of course, for her father. We'll talk to her about being who she wants to be and who she has to be because of something her father did years before she was born. And it changed so many things, some in ways he never imagined and some in ways he never wanted. People have asked me, do you think he would have done it knowing what would, would have come after? Hard to tell. It looks like it could be Beatlemania in 64 or a Sinatra Bobby Soxer riot in 44, but this is Lindbergh hysteria in Paris in 1927. Tens of thousands of people had come in expectation of his arrival. Lindbergh had expected interest, certainly, reporters and photographers, but not pandemonium. He had to almost be protected from the crowd. So when people were taking pieces off his plane, and uh, some were trying to get clips off his, his clothing. Lindbergh had thought he'd give a few interviews in Paris, show some people his plane, buy a toothbrush and a change of clothes, and maybe be a tourist for a couple of days. What happened was beyond anything he could have imagined. Because in a way, he didn't even know himself what he had done. The whole event of the flight is bigger than the person. He was perfectly cast for the role of hero, young, good-looking, a man with roots in America's pioneering past, leading us into a new technological frontier. He would continue to be one of the most important figures in early aviation, but his life would be tumultuous, tragic, and controversial. But in 1927, he was, at this moment in history, the right man at the right time. He was not quite the simple Minnesota farm boy he was made out to be. His mother was a chemistry teacher, his father a lawyer, and U.S. congressman, and Lindbergh had spent time in Washington, D.C. and Detroit as well as the family farm. He had dropped out of engineering school to fly and became a barnstormer, which was about all a pilot could do. Fly around to cities and towns putting on air shows, making parachute jumps, walking out on the wings in mid-flight then you'd make money selling rides and giving lessons. Like a lot of aviators in the Midwest, Lindbergh eventually made his way to St. Louis. He came to see the big air races here in 1923 and hooked up with the barnstorming troupe that flew around the Midwest. When the government began awarding contracts to private companies to carry the mail, Lindbergh was hired by St. Louis's Robertson Aircraft Company as its chief pilot on the St. Louis to Chicago route. He flew out of Lambert Field, just a grassy area back then, and lived in rented rooms nearby. There was at the flying field something of a boys club, locker room atmosphere, and Lindbergh had a reputation as a practical joker. A fellow pilot remembered him putting kerosene in a bucket of drinking water, another time running an electrical wire to a metal bench. When they're all sitting there comfortably while he cranked the booster, and <laughs> they jump with a shock. Of course, they chased him around, too, because he did that. But he was a lot of fun in that respect. But Lindbergh also had a reputation as a good, sharp pilot. And it was during his many hours flying the airmail route, somewhere around Peoria, he said, 
that he first thought about trying to win the Ortigue Prize, $25,000 offered for the first nonstop flight between New York and Paris. It was a flight that created numerous challenges, including the basic problem of simply finding your way. Lindbergh had no experience in air navigation other than what he had gained on the airmail routes. But over water, he was going to be faced with an entirely different type of navigation, uh, again, known as dead reckoning, where he would fly time to evaluate and speed to evaluate distance, and he would use a very rudimentary magnetic compass in order to tell direction. But Lindbergh convinced a few key downtown businessmen that he could do this, and they invested the money to buy the plane, gambled really on something that could be a huge boost to aviation and to St. Louis, if he could do it, and if he could do it first. He was able to get the Spirit of St. Louis built by the small Ryan Aircraft Company in San Diego when bigger companies shied away from putting their good names into the hands of an unknown Midwestern airmail pilot. Lindbergh flew the brand new plane to St. Louis on his way to New York to show it to his backers. There he is with banker and Chamber of Commerce President Harold Bixby. He had spearheaded the fundraising and suggested the name for the plane. Another backer is Albert von Lambert. This was his airport. As important as their money was, was their decision to trust Lindbergh and his plan for a solo flight with a single engine plane, which seemed to go against all common sense. The thinking was you'd want one of those new three-engine planes to go non-stop across the ocean, and trimotors would become the standard for early passenger service. But Lindbergh explained that if an engine quit somewhere over the ocean, he couldn't complete the trip to Paris. He could only circle around hoping to find a ship to crash near. Three engines, he figured, three times the chance for failure, and these big planes were too expensive anyway. People also figured you'd need at least two people on this expected 40-hour flight. A second man would navigate and take over flying when the other pilot was resting. But Lindbergh insisted that he could do this himself, and one less man meant that he could carry that much more fuel. Everything was the ultimate of simplification. He didn't have a lot of instrumentation. Uh, there weren't a lot of uh, other systems or components in the airplane. Uh, it was the basic rudiments of flight. The risks were very real. Attempts by two other teams, French and American, had already ended in tragedy when their planes, heavily loaded with the fuel needed for the long non-stop flight, crashed on takeoff. And just before Lindbergh's attempt, two French flyers had managed to take off from Paris, but disappeared and were never found. Ryan Aircraft accepted the challenge and the risk of Lindbergh's plan and designed and built this plane in just two months. It was shorter and lighter than normal because it needed only one seat, placed behind the big fuel tank. Lindbergh could not even see out the front of this plane. Its landing gear was specially made to handle the load. The wingspan was 10 feet longer than normal for extra lift. The airplane was designed specifically for the crossing. Uh, one of the interesting aspects of it is uh, Charles Lindbergh did all the flight testing on that airplane himself. And uh, no one else had ever flown the airplane, or has ever flown the airplane. Lindbergh was confident he could make this flight. He just thought he was now too late to be the first. Two other teams were in New York ready to go and they knew Lindbergh was on his way. He was the dark horse, pretty much a one-man operation and that turned out to be his edge. All three teams got the same report of clearing weather, but on the morning of May 20th, 1927, only the spirit of St. Louis was being rolled out to the airstrip. One team's mechanics were insisting on more test flights, and the other team's pilots were feuding and had gone to court. Lindbergh's backers were still in St. Louis. Their advice, when you're ready, go ahead. For the first time this morning, the spirit of St. Louis's fuel tanks would be filled to capacity. Lindbergh knew, in theory, it could take off fully fueled. It's just that he'd never actually tried it. And this morning, the wind wasn't quite right. The grassy landing strip was still wet, softer and slower than he would have liked. Lindbergh himself had hardly gotten any sleep the night before. 
but his years as a barnstormer and airmail pilot had taught him to weigh the risks and trust his judgment. And he knew if you waited for everything to be perfect, you might never take off. And he nearly didn't make it. He passed the point where he could abort the takeoff and the spirit of St. Louis was still bouncing up and down as Lindbergh fought to get it into the air. Maybe he was lucky, maybe he was good, maybe he was both. The spirit of St. Louis cleared the telephone wires beyond the runway by just 20 feet. He was on his way. The 20s were sort of a decade of, in many respects, of disillusionment. We had been through the Great War and we had corruption in the government and a lot of people thought that the morals of the country were going to the dogs and this sort of thing. It, in a way, he, I think you could see Lindbergh as somebody who embodied what American, Americans or America would like to be in the ideal order. He had thrilled and inspired and amazed the world, but not himself. As Lindbergh had said about barnstorming tricks, they weren't nearly as dangerous as they looked to the people on the ground. Not if you assessed the risks, took the precautions, and had a good pilot. He was a very, very much a stickler for care in every single aspect of your life. He was not ever sort of flamboyant. He was very quiet. There is a way in which my parents marked people's lives. And you want to honor both your own sense of the truth and the feelings of the people who bring to you their gift <laughs> of their connection or their memory or their impression of your parents. There was tragedy and controversy in the Lindberghs' lives, the kidnapping and murder of their child. And later, Charles Lindbergh's political views, friendly relations with pre-war Nazi Germany, tarnished his hero's image. But he's been dead a long time, since 1974. Where do you think, how will they survive, uh, both as, as your mother as a writer, I would think, and your father as, well, I can only say Charles Lindbergh, because yeah. there really isn't anyone you know, I can compare him to. There's something about the story uh, of the two of them, about his, his role in that incredible burgeoning of aviation, whatever else he was or, or did will be part of it. But I think mostly what we're going to see over time, I think, is the aviator. <laughs>